Good morning, friends. Welcome. Welcome to worship in this place. We are glad you are with us today. We have new friends with us on Zoom and new friends with us in this room. And we are here to worship together. Thank you for being with us. This is the time when we share announcements with the community. So if you are in the room and you have an announcement, I think I'm going to um, just invite you to come to the microphone and I will step away and let us try it that way. So is there anyone in the room who has an announcement? Good morning. Um, last Thursday, we had a delightful ladies lunch via Zoom. And this Thursday, it's the men's turn. So if you um, are free on Thursday at 1145 or so, um, there's a link in the mosaic. And I think Ian's going to send out another um, email that has the link this week. So come and have fun the way the women did. Thanks. I put several announcements in the bulletin, but I want to just share that um, yesterday we were delighted to go to Rhode Island um, because Jonathan and our son Andrew put on a recital, um, a, a Malone family recital, which is posted on Facebook. It, it was um, some real high quality music and a whole lot of fun. But the other thing that I, he showed me yesterday, Jonathan, um, prepared for the Imagine, the uh, ABC Biennial, Jonathan, who is, works with the um, American Baptist Historical Society, um, prepared a really interesting um, program highlighting three different um, people from the past, of, um, of American Baptist people and their contribution to American Baptist life. Um, I know that you, can, you when, when you attend the biennial, you can access this and, and it's not too late to register and there are scholarship funds available, it's in the bulletin, um, but um, you can also access that particular piece um, through, the, through Jonathan's church Facebook site or their YouTube site, they have all these things, but um, it was really, it was a hysterical, Jonathan is a very funny person, um, and, and he did a fantastic job, but we learned about three different people, don't ask me their names, um, I only really remember that the third one was a, um, a missionary from Japan who worked in the um, Japanese internment camps. So there's some really interesting historical stuff. Check it out, um, or you can talk to me and I can send you the link. But And think about coming to the Biennial and the Women's Day. Women's Day there's always a Women's Day at the Biennial, and that's this Saturday. Um, and if you've not registered, they probably will still take you in uh, um, if you want to sign up for Women's Day. I'll be there. Oh, yeah, the cakes are the cakes. Um, those of you who don't always come into the back to the fellowship hall uh, and sneak out that way, you'll probably want to take a little skip through because we made a cake strictly from the Bible. Everything is from the Bible. Um, so come and taste it. I'm sorry for you guys on Zoom that, that you can't taste it, but I can send you the recipe.
This is why I had you do this. Yeah, the camp, we are having a campfire on Friday. Um, and the only thing you have to do is let me know you're coming. We'll have some more again. Please do uh, read the announcements that were sent by email. If you don't get email, I have some paper copies of that. I also have paper copies of the questions for next week. Those are on the tables as they've been for the last two Sundays. And um, there are paper copies available of the survey being sponsored by Pastoral Relations. If you brought a paper copy of your survey that you want to turn in, there's a box with that label on it in Fellowship Hall. So when you go to get your scripture cake, you can drop your um, survey there. And there's blank surveys to be filled out if you, if you haven't actually seen one yet. We have a couple of people who have joined us today on Zoom. So I wanted to take a moment and introduce them. Uh, one person is Monica Tucker. And many of you know Monica. I have not yet had the pleasure of meeting Monica in person. I know her as Elaine's daughter and the mother of Elaine's grandchildren, which is probably from Elaine's point of view, all I need to know. But um, I am uh, delighted that you are with us today, Monica, and uh, all the way from North Carolina. And I do look forward to meeting you and getting to know you in your own right. Also with us today is Arlen Bernava. Arlen is, um, Arlen is someone I have known for a little while. He is an American Baptist pastor whose vocation is intentional interim work. So he is joining us today from his home in Queensbury, New York, but he is just, just home from a interim that he was serving, a longer term interim in Ohio. Arlen and I are part of a Tuesday clergy Bible study. That's how we've mostly gotten to know each other. And now that we do it on Zoom, he can join from wherever in the United States he is. A few months ago, Arlen um, asked to place membership at Emmanuel, and uh, he had conversation with our, uh, what used to be called membership in evangelism. I don't remember what we call them now. And they presented Arlen to the exec team for membership, which we um, heartily approved and endorsed. And so we have been waiting for Arlen to get back from Ohio and for some other things to happen so that we will have another opportunity to offer an official right hand of fellowship. But today, uh, we are just glad that you're with us, Arlen. So welcome, welcome home and welcome to Emmanuel, to everyone. Thank you all. So friends, our question for today is, where does it hurt? In the next hour, we are going to name together some sources of hurt. And our Bible story deals with the pain of infertility. Some of us know that particular pain intimately, or we may know the loss or absence of a child in other ways. This is a deep and ongoing pain. And our intention today is not to uh, be painful, but to bear witness to that pain and to others. It may be that something in our time together today triggers something for you. If that happens, please know that you do not suffer in silence. I'm available to listen, to hear your story, to pray with you. Please just reach out to me and let me know. And I'm not the only one. It may be that the person you need to speak to is not me, but another friend or companion in the congregation. Please know that you are not alone. Let us center ourselves, prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
Well, good morning. So we're going to talk a little bit about a hurt, but first I'm so thirsty I'm going to have some water. Uh, wait a minute. Um, but somebody, I don't know if you can see this, put some chemicals in it. Oh, it's kind of cloudy. And then somebody uh, put some dirt in it. Okay, here we go. Um, I think I'll pass on the water right now. Um, so we assume when we drink water that it's going to be okay. As a matter of fact, we're so crazy in this country, we buy water in, in plastic bottles. That's crazy. Don't drink this. So um, let's just watch the video and then we'll talk about it afterwards. Where, where, where does it hurt? Little man, little man found out a raccoon, very, very sad. sad. He was crying. Little, little man, man asked, asked why, why are you crying? crying? No, the raccoon, raccoon says, well, you know how raccoons, raccoons, raccoons need to need wash their, their food in the water? water? Well, I just, well, I just heard, heard that there's so many, many people, people in the world that don't that have, have any water, water and they haven't spent all day trying to find good water. No, no clean, clean water, water gives, gives me, me a hurt, hurt inside. inside. So, so I'm, I'm filling, filling as many water bottles, bottles as I can, can and, and I'm going to send them all over the world. world. Little man says, that's, that's really, really not going to work. work. Naughty, Naughty raccoon. raccoon. There's, There's something, something you can you do, do that's, that's much, much better. better. Just, Just watch, watch this, this video. video. When it comes, everything changes. Children can go to school. Women can start businesses to help support their families. Crops can grow. Neighbors can take care of each other. Markets can thrive. Families can be families. When water comes to a village, everything changes. Water is essential to life and the life of a village. We are giving makes projects like new wealth in villages possible. Give to one great hour of sharing and let love flow. So here's what you do, Naughty Raccoon. Write a check to Emmanuel Baptist for one great hour. Or put some money in the collection plate if you go there on Sunday. Or you can use their website, emmanuelalbany.net. Naughty Raccoon did that. Naughty Raccoon had felt their hurt inside. Then he did something about it. So you can give to one great hour. It's a great thing to do. And that hurt inside you is going to be better too. Why? Just look at Naughty Raccoon now. Well, Naughty Raccoon had saved a lot of money and he gave it to One Great Hour. Guess what I'm going to ask you to do? So this month of June is the One Great Hour month at Emmanuel. You have an opportunity to give. You can give once a week for four weeks. You can give it all at once. You can do whatever you like, but you definitely have to give because Naughty Raccoon figured out 
when other people hurt, you help them and then their hurt gets better and you get better. So that's what we have to do. Thank you. Now we're gonna uh, move to the call to worship. My friend and grandchild Judah is gonna help me. Take your mask off. Here in the space, we wear our hearts on our sleeves. So our walls. This space is an authentic space. This space is a brave space. For when it comes to God, we are always invited to bring our full selves into the room. So come into the space with your hurt and your joy, your prayers and your dreams. All of God's children are welcome here. Let us worship holy God. Our first hymn is Let Us Build a House. It is going to be sung for us by four members of our choir. So if you are at home on Zoom, I invite you to just sing out loud along with them. And if you're here in this space, I invite you to attend to the music and the words which will be on the screen and to sing along in heart and mind. Let us build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live. A place where saints and children tell how hearts learn to forgive. Built of hopes and dreams and visions, rock of faith and bolt of grace. Here the love of Christ shall end divisions. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where prophets speak and words are strong and true. build a house where love is found in water, wine, and wheat, a banquet hall on holy ground where peace and justice meet. Hear the love of God through Jesus is revealed in time and space. As we share in Christ the feast that frees us, all are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where hands will reach beyond the wood and stone. Bring an end to fear and pain. 
Thank you. Listen, for the things that break our hearts. This week you said, my heart breaks when I hear of immigrants and refugees seeking safety and a better life, when they are met with anger, disdain, and violence. When I learn about accelerating extinctions caused by human misuse and abuse of the environment, my heart also breaks when I consider the cruelty that humans can inflict on one another, especially in the context of racism. When I see my grandchildren absorbing the stress of their parents' divorce and acting out because of it, and worry about the long-term implications of it all. When I hear of another random shooting of innocent victims. When I see children bullying another child. When I see a child crying. When the most vulnerable and threatened among us are harmed by instruments of power and greed for selfish or monetary interest when children are hurt, when parents are unable to care for children and social service or child protective agencies fail to protect them. When I have read of the cruel treatment of Native Americans, both in the present and the past and similar treatment of any people of color. When I see the pain behind the eyes of an unwanted child not knowing or feeling loved by their parents. When I hear news of children killed in senseless rounds of violence in Israel and Palestine. When innocent people are killed in drive-by shootings. When families go hungry and without health care in our extraordinarily rich country. When I listen to politics throughout the US and the entire world. When I see my children struggling with emotional toil that I wish I could shield them from. When I learned of the death of my best friend's wife. When I think about all of the wrongs we have done to indigenous people all over the world and how much culture has been lost in the name of Christianity and progress. When I see the starving children in so many warring countries and the immigrants fleeing for their lives. And when I think about children without food, I smelled fresh baked chocolate cookies recently and it struck me that I know children who haven't eaten a cookie in years. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Cassandra and Samantha Paul, who are two of our recent high school graduates, are going to lead us in our call and prayer of confession. When we gather together, we are quick to wave and say hello, to comment on the weather, to make small talk and show hospitality. But how often do we go below the surface? How often do we sit next to the same people week after week, oblivious to the things they may be carrying? I believe God wants deeper connection for us than that. So listen now to our prayer of confession and then join in the silent prayer that follows. Let us pray. I've been meaning to ask, how are you? What has your year been like? Did you know that I've been thinking of you? I've been meaning to ask, is your mom okay? Did your sister find a job? Did you ever think we'd still be here? I've been meaning to ask, did it get easier? Did the grief subside? Were you ever able to sleep at night? I've been meaning to ask, but I haven't. Because it's hard, because I want to say the right thing, because I'm not sure what you need. I've been meaning to ask, so I'm sorry for my silence. Forgive me, show me where it hurts. 
Let's start again. Friends, we could all use some practice in asking where it hurts. Take a moment of silent prayer to think of the people in your world, in your lives, who may need to reach, who you may need to reach out and ask. Give their names to God. Trusting that God hears all things, we say together, amen. Friends, in the journey to love and care for one another, we are bound to make mistakes. Fortunately for us, we worship a God who showed us how to love and who extends grace to us when we fail to do so for others. So hear and believe the good news of the gospel. We are seen, we are heard, we are loved, we are forgiven. Amen. Bearing witness to the pain of others helps us to cultivate compassion. Our next hymn is a song about yearning for Jesus to walk with us in our pain and in the ways we care for others. So I invite you in this space to remain seated and allow this music to be your soul music. And following this song, Cassandra will read our scripture passage. Scripture reading is Samuel 1, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. There was a certain man from Ramatham, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hopni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. 
Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than 10 sons? Once when they had finished eating and drinking, drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly, and she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. This is the time when we share concerns and joys before we pray together. So I would it. I would invite people in the room to share first, and then we will give an opportunity for people on Zoom. And um, I'm gonna invite you to speak from where you are and I will repeat it into the microphone. So are there people in the room who have concerns to share? Let us pray together. Holy One, we know that you hear our prayers. You are the God of hospital rooms and graveside services. You are the God who felt a touch in a crowd. You are the God who sees and knows all pain, illness, infertility, disease, and despair. You are the God of the hurt and the healing. So we know you hear us today. So with open hearts and open hands, gracious God, we come to give you our joy and our pain. With joy, we give you thanks for all the blessings in our lives, for sunny days and spring flowers, for the hope of a vaccine, for graduations and other milestones, for messages of hope in sidewalk chalk, for new opportunities, to visit with family and for new friends in this room and on Zoom. We give you thanks. We have so much to be thankful for and we know that you are part of all that. And yet in the very same breath, we also carry pain. We desperately need your ears, your grace, your healing touch. So today we lift to you all the pain and hurt we carry, those things that break our hearts, those things of which we are afraid. We pray for Becca's Uncle James in a nursing home dealing with dementia. We pray for the families and neighbors of Victor and Lois and all who mourn them. We pray for McKendra. We pray for Ken, for Kathy and Judy's friend with Lyme. We pray for our companions, Elaine and Rosemary, and others whose needs we may not yet know. We hold all of this before you because holy God, we know that you are listening. We know that you are here. For you are the God of hospital rooms and graveside services. 
be among us, hold our hurt, heal our wounds, draw us closer to one another and closer to you. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Lord, listen to your you to hear the fears and anxieties that we shared this week as read by Samantha. So this is how we've been responding to this week's prompt about fears. One of my persistent fears or anxieties is that I won't speak up that I will be too cautious when an opportunity arises, when I can affect change, when I can adv advocate for those who cannot speak, about the inevitable losses of growing older, experiencing a return of cancer to either myself or my husband, that there are people in this world who will, who will never know a life without war or violence, that a family member or close friend will be injured or seriously ill, watching our democracy being destroyed, war, that I will lose the ability, mentally, physically, spiritually, or emotionally, to take an active part in addressing injustice and working for peace. Dementia in me or my wife. Reoccurrences of January 6th, 2021. That I will let others down. That my children are not safe when they are not in my care. The willingness of so many people in the United States to believe the big lie and put our democracy at risk and endanger our ability to vote about the health and well-being of my friends and family. Some live on the edge and some live stuck in unhappy situations, losing people I care about. That we will not heed the voices of our contemporary prophets, those sages, old or young, to wake up in time and save our fragile blue pearl of great price. Thank you, Cassandra and Samantha, for leading so much of our time together this morning. It happened every year. They packed up the family and went to Shiloh to celebrate Thanksgiving. At Shiloh, they went to church where their food was cooked on the altar. Some of it was burned on purpose. That was God's part. A certain portion then went to the priest and the rest was to be enjoyed by the family over the next two days of feasting and festival. So when they sat around the table, Elkanah carved the roast that was theirs to share. The tradition in the land was that the oldest son got two helpings, but Elkanah did not keep that tradition. His tradition was to give two helpings to Hannah, who had no sons or daughters at all. He made no secret that Hannah was his favorite wife, and that understandably angered Penina, his not favorite other wife. So year after year, they packed up the family and celebrated Thanksgiving. Year after year, Elkanah carved the roast and gave twice as much to Hannah as Penina. That made Penina feel hurt and rejected, so she took it out on Hannah by taunting her. Then Hannah would get upset and lose her appetite for the holiday meal, and Elkanah, in his clueless way, would say, why are you so upset, Hannah? Hannah is a childless woman in a time and place where bearing sons is pretty much the total measure of her worth and honor. 
Elkanah loves her, but he doesn't seem to understand the depths of her pain and despair, and his efforts to help only make things worse. This pattern goes on like they do in dysfunctional families year after year until Hannah just cannot take it any longer. She gets up from the table and goes to the temple to pour her heart out to God. You probably remember other biblical women who suffered with infertility, women like Sarah and Rebecca. In their case, it was Abraham and Isaac, their husbands, who prayed and pleaded with God for a child. But in this story, it is Hannah herself who goes directly to God. This is, in fact, the only, the first time in the Bible that we have a, a record of a person praying like this in a holy place of worship, and it happens to be a woman. The story says she was deeply distressed and wept bitterly. She was brokenhearted and telling God about it. Perhaps she rocked back and forth. Maybe she paced. Either her lips moved in silent prayer or she spoke aloud and Eli the priest was hard of hearing and couldn't hear what she was saying. He also did not expect to find a woman praying there. So he jumped to the conclusion that she was drunk and he told her to quit making a spectacle of herself. Her pain is mocked by her sister wife, diminished by her husband and invalidated by her spiritual leader. Perhaps something like that has happened to you. Those are the things that teach us to hide our pain, even maybe to be ashamed of it. We may even start to believe that it is wrong to feel what we feel. And so we bury it deeper, which of course does not heal anything. Hannah's pain is long lasting. It is about one thing, infertility, and also about many other things which have become part of its complexity. The writer of 1 Samuel devotes 18 verses to describing her hurt. So I invite us to sit with that for a bit, to recognize that this community, this place, should be one where we don't have to pretend that everything is fine. This is a place where we are learning to be real with each other. Many of you will remember Lima Bowie, Several years ago, we watched the film, Pray the Devil Back to Hell. It was about the nonviolent movement of women who played a pivotal role in ending Liberia's devastating 14 year long civil war. Lima Bowie was a key leader of that movement. Lima was the fourth of five daughters. Her name Lima means, what about me? As in, why can't I conceive a son from the point of view of her mother? Her name suggests what her memoir bears out, that there was pain and hurt from an early age in her family of origin. And then when she was 17 years old, her country went to war with itself. She personally endured much of the suffering inherent in war the terror of enemy soldiers on her street, bullets sprayed through her living room, fleeing with her children with the clothes on their backs to a refugee camp across the border. She also managed 
somehow to get an education during those years. And she became a social worker specializing in trauma counseling. She became an organizer, organizing women whose voices were never heard in public arenas or private spaces where decisions were made, but who were also always the victims of displacement, rape, starvation, and other war crimes. When she met with women, she would write the word nonsense on the chalkboard and then cross out the prefix non. She told the women that everything we will say in here makes sense. So don't be afraid to talk. Say what is true for you. In her book, Mighty Be Our Powers, she describes traveling to a camp for internally displaced people. In an outdoor shelter, 50 women gathered to share their experiences during the war, to speak of their trauma. She called this exercise shedding the weight because it encouraged the women to divest themselves of the emotional burdens that they were bearing. Listening to women unburden themselves was always hard, but on this one day, there were so many stories of violence and shame and grief, so many sobs and wails, so much pain that she reached a point where she just didn't think she could take it anymore. We can stop, she said. It's okay. And then a very old woman rose up on her walking stick. Don't let us stop, she said. The UN brings us food and shelter and clothes, but what you've brought is much more valuable. You've come to hear the stories from our bellies, stories that no one else asks us about. Please don't stop. Don't ever stop. That old woman understood the power of being heard, of sharing your story, of having your pain acknowledged and validated. That is the power that was healing for Hannah. After she poured out her hurt and pain to God, after Eli the priest finally respectfully acknowledged her and prayed for her. The text says that she went home and she ate and drank and was no longer sad. She was seen and heard. There are two pivotal points in Hannah's story. The first one is in verse nine, when she has carried her shame and despair as long as she can. And the text says, Hannah rose. After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Hannah rose. She did not give up. She did not bury herself in bitterness or continue to lash out at Elkanah and Penina. And she did not stuff it down inside her. Hannah rose. She got up and took action. With vulnerability and courage, she bears her whole story, her whole self to God. Reverend James Forbes, former pastor at Riverside Church in New York City, preached a now famous sermon called Hannah Rose. He preached this uh, on more than one occasion in various pulpits across the country. And in it, he suggested that anyone looking for a name for a daughter might choose that one, Hannah Rose, for what Hannah did in her hour of distress. There are at least 20 women known now to bear that name because of that sermon, including his own granddaughter. The first turning point in the story is Hannah's ability to rise and speak her truth. And the second turning point happens in the encounter with Eli. Hurt is shared, pain is acknowledged, and there is healing. 
where does it hurt? Beloved ones, for some of us, it is an act of faith and real courage to answer that. It requires trust that God is listening, that God cares. And when we stop to name what breaks our hearts as some of us did this week, we get a glimpse of all that God is holding for us. We see the enormity and the depth of the pain in our families and our neighborhoods, in our country, and across the whole world. When we bear witness to the honest, real pain of others, when we listen with openness and acceptance, we enter into their suffering. And sometimes we may be an instrument of healing and peace. It is one way that we follow the Christ who gives rest to those carrying heavy burdens and binds up the brokenhearted. It is one way. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we prepare for communion, I would invite you to attend to the lyrics on the screen and the music of our choir as they sing communion prayer. that everyone received communion elements as you came into the sanctuary, you will want to find those now. If you did not, and you would raise your hand, we will get them to you. This table is not ours, but Christ's, and the risen Christ invites all who love him and who want to love him more to join him at this life-giving meal. Here at this table, we can bring the different pieces of ourselves, our dreams, our fear, our joy, our insecurity, our pain and hurt, and all will be welcomed. So come you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have been here often, and you who have not been here for a long time. 
you who have tried to follow and you who have failed. Come not because it is I who invite you, but because it is Jesus, our Lord. Would you pray with me? God, in your open hand, we place our own, whether we met you long ago or in this very moment. We pray that you would send your spirit of life and blessing upon all of us gathered anywhere, in any way, so that this bread may be broken and received in love and this fruit of the vine poured out to give the world hope. Risen Christ, as you have faith in us, may we have faith in you. Breathe in us that we may breathe in you. Amen. At this table, we remember that among friends gathered at a table, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. The bread of pain, the bread of peace, take and eat. On that same night, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. I choose you that you might bear fruit that will last. So today we share the fruit of the vine either as grapes or as juice. That fruit of suffering love. Take and eat or drink. Often at the conclusion of this meal, we sing, blessed be the tie that binds. Today, I invite us to affirm our faith together in words that convey much of what that song conveys. So would you join in the affirmation of faith using the words on the screen? On my best days, I believe that God is there standing in the sun with me, laughing a contagious laugh and cheering me on. On my hardest days, I believe that God is there, standing in the rain with me, holding me up and sharing in my grief. No matter where I go, in joy or loss, in pain or in love, in heartache, or gratitude, I believe that God is there, leaning in, noticing where it hurts and carrying me through it. And so I believe we are called to care for each other as God cares for us. On your best days in the sun and on your worst days in the rain, I will do my best to be there for you too. Amen. I would invite you when uh, the postlude is over to move into Fellowship Hall, which is through that doorway, um, to enjoy fellowship time and scripture cake. And if you are on Zoom um, and you wish to stay in this space, please do. We will. Um, we will figure out how to speak with you. It's a little more complicated on our end, but we'll make it happen. Um, and now would you receive a benediction? Beloved ones, as you leave this place, 
May God grant you the curiosity to counter assumptions, the vulnerability to befriend, the bravery to speak your truth, the wisdom to listen, the strength to ask for help, the resiliency to choose love even when it's hard, and the awareness of the Holy Spirit always, always beside you. In the name of the great connector, love itself, go in peace. Amen.